describing it to Juliet, the publisher from Monroe, and trying to find a way to explain how a book with so many plots and without one single plot still gave you a narrative arc and still gave you a sense of catharsis, but in a way that is perfectly described in, now in the quote that you have at the beginning, which is the Carol and Duffy one, which is, um, I think poetry could tell it backwards than it would. And I remember telling her that it was each little gem of the book was like a salmon that was swimming against the tide mm. that, that popped up because every now and again you think, even though the voice, there are five voices in the book, you think, I've heard this or something that echoes this sentiment or this image before. And only really when you get to the very end do you have a complete sense of where all of those, those points were leading to, even though the whole way through it's a very kind of pleasing kind of almost scenic mm. sense. And, and, and I said to her, it was a, a mad book in that sense because nothing really pulled together until you realise that every single moment and word pulled together. And she said, we love mad books. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I was going to ask you if that was something that you thought of doing on purpose or other, novel, other novels that you read and that you liked doing that. Mm. Well, yes, it w I did it on purpose, but it wasn't the first thing I did. At first I was really concentrated in finding different voices and I thought for a long time, not for that long, for the first few months when I was working, I thought I was writing a book of short stories. And so then when I, I was dealing with several uh, young feminine voices and I was afraid that they would not be as distinguished as is it to differ one yeah. from the other. And so for some reason, I guess it's kind of counterintuitive, but I decided the, fir the best way I had to not get them mixed was to make them all know each other. So that's how they started living in the same place. Once they were living in the same place, I was still working on the voices separately. And I was still thinking, even when I had decided the chronological structure so that we would follow these people for five years, and there would be this Tragically, there are two deaths that happen very close to each other in time inside this little community. And I had decided the book would go backwards, but I still had one whole voice, the next one, and, and that wasn't really working because I had all these ideas coming up of how things would connect mm -hmm. and how I was not only working in different voices because I was trying to, I was really interested in building characters both ways from the inside of how they talk about themselves or how, how the narrator talks about them and from the outside how they see each other. Mm. So I had all these like rich ideas of how to connect these things but it, it became like it was too far away. Yeah. So I, I realized I had to bring them close together and, and I, one day I just like started playing Tetris. Do you say that in yeah. Tetris? And it really worked and it became very liberating because then I already had the voices and I had this time frame that allowed me to draw these bridges. But was it really complicated when she started playing Tetris? Because what's so amazing, I'm probably the person who's read this book more than anyone in the world. I'm always <laughs> certain. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but what's amazing to me still is how, is how, I think, goodness, how did Laia remember, or as she was editing the book, how did she remember that bit that, 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 that suited so perfectly, that, that part that's just gone from Alf, say, or mm -hmm. from Anna, and then, what, did you move phrases as well? Did you oh, yeah. shuffle everything? Yeah, bit? I moved a lot of things around, but, you know, I, I was telling you the other day, I, I have, I, don't, I almost have no childhood memories. I have very bad memory. Even the trips I did two years ago, I've already forgotten. Uh, but for some reason, I have an extraordinary memory, memory for things I'm writing. Like, I knew this book by heart. Now I don't, because for two years I've been working on something else, and now I know that thing by heart. So I, I was really able to... I was working in something, and I would think, oh, if this character says this, this can be referenced over there with a complete point of view and that would be interesting if a reader remembers. Yeah. And it doesn't really matter if, it do, if yeah. the reader doesn't. And I also, I was, I came from, all my life I have written either theatre or short stories, so the things I was always worried about, one was scene and building, because it's oh, a very, it's it's not the, it's not drama at all. It's not theater, but it's very scenic in that you. I think it's visual and you. And I had the muse that was like my own yeah. stage. Yeah, there is a stage exactly, and you stay there. And I the other thing I'm, I'm more always worrying about is like that. 
unity of short stories. Like, and now with this shortish chapters, I don't think there are chapters that are more like 20 or 30 pages, no? So I, I wanted them to also be independent. Like you could yeah. read that before bed. Yeah. And then like go to sleep knowing that you took that away and then that, that's part of a whole, but also in itself. So, so that that was probably the hard part, like getting that balance of independence and codependence. Yeah. Okay. And and you say that you remember a book so well and that when whenever you're in a book you're completely in it. Did that make it somewhat difficult with all the translators, not just with me translating into English. Did you find that that helped the process, that you were able to kind of go back to it and your memory was jogged and all of these details that we went through for months, really, yeah. and then probably thousands of emails. Do you think that that had to do with it? Do you think that helped? Yeah, definitely. But the thing is, when I was working with you, I still had it pretty fresh in my head. Mm -hmm. Whereas now, for example, let me remind you with a Dutch translator and now with the Italian one. Uh, I've been writing this movie for two years, so now uh, Umami has gone to a, like another department in my head, and now mm -hmm. I find it hard. I still know, like when we're looking fragments to read the other day, yeah. I could, but it's not like I have a precise image of everything. And one thing I've learned with working with the translators is that they all really work in very different ways, and you're the only one with with whom I really work together, like we were going yeah. through the text, we were like, you remember that we had all these color-coded notes on the sides, and it was just crazy. And, <laughs> it was, <laughs> and it was beautiful too, because I, you're the first person I've ever really worked with that it's, had ever read my work so closely. So, yeah. And whereas a lot of translators I work with uh, just have a lot of questions, mm -hmm. and so they just email me the questions and I write back, and I'm not, basically because I don't speak their language, I'm not working on their text. Yeah. Um, were there any parts of the book that you felt, this is a difficult question, <laughs> that you felt didn't, didn't sound in English like you expected them to sound? Or, or, because the voices for me, I had to translate into American English and there are American characters, so that made sense as yeah. well. At, like I imagine at first we worked quite a lot to get the American little girls' voices yeah. right. Well I don't think any of it sounds like I would have imagined and I think that's why it's so important that I have you and have because I could not translate myself. I think that's kind of what I learned. I had tried before with short stories. Even some of the short stories mm, that you translated yeah, yeah. you said no I don't want to look at it, which I think is intelligent, but I had tried and it doesn't work. Uh, it works for me to write in English mm. but it doesn't work for me to translate to English because it it's not my language, so I'm inevitably doing like a literal thing. I think it's about choices, isn't it? With self-translation, I think that the whatever the three people in the world are, are literally great who've been able to manage it. Um, what's amazing about them having done that is that is that for me the translating out of your native tongue is you kind of lose options. So you may have four ways of saying certain things, but if it's not your native, you may just have three. And what if that fourth one? Right. That exists in the native language yeah. would have been the would have been the best. So one. There, you remember there were like these passages, for example, the prayers, Marina's prayers. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should yeah, read some. Yeah, definitely. I just it was so much easier for me to completely write new ones. So this is Marina, who is has got a, a, a lot of kind of abandonment issues and eating disorders, and she's she went to um, a hospital basically to be cured and the nurses tried to make her do repeat things and so she decided to re repeat the Lord's Prayer but it's not working for her. So she says, Our Father, who art in Devon, Halloween be thy name. Your whiskey gone, you will be prone to bursts of laughter and rage. Give us this day our daily taste of fasting. Forgive us our thefts as we forgive your bad taste. Our Father, who art incompetent, hallowed be thy name. Your fiascos come, give us each day our daily fail. And forgive us our lack of hunger, forgive our breath if it comes out stale. Your wisdom come, I will be gone. <laughs> that was fun. So all the characters of the novel live inside a, a muse that was designed from a little um, drawing of the tongue that we used to be taught at school that said, um, that in a part of the tongue it feel the salty and in another one the sweet and another one which later they have discovered it's actually completely fake 
Um, but he uses the, the, the owner of the plot is a food anthropologist and he's really interested in umami, which is a flavor, it's a fifth flavor, and it's only known in Japan at that moment in the 70s and 80s. And he's trying to introduce it to Mexican gastronomy. And he names his house umami and then he gives each of the other little four houses a name of one of the flavors. So all the characters live here. And this same character, he has lost his wife and other and another family that lives there has lost a little girl. So these are the two deaths that set the set the book in motion. And so it's pretty much a book about grief. But also because it has a span of five years, it's also very much a book about the end of grief and and the character that opens the book is the sister of the girl who died and she is trying to build a garden and in a way it's kind of a metaphor of the end of grief but really what I think now is a better metaphor for it is just umami because umami is this flavor that it's very hard to pinpoint and if you add more MSG or more salt, the kind of salt that gives umami, it will turn very easily to sweet or salty so it's very hard to and I think grief, when it's ending, can be a little bit like that. Mm. Like you can easily turn to maybe maybe memories that before would only hurt start giving also like a certain happiness. Yeah. But then you immediately remember that you lost that and you go back to you know. So it's and the whole structure of the novel really now. Once I had decided, once the Tetris Tetris was done and I had an image of it on my mind, it's really just like the waves of grief. Yeah. Because you keep coming back to the year when they lost these people and then yeah. you come to the present when they're getting it's the better. As well. you, yeah. At the very moment. Five times the book goes like that. It was very important for me to write a book about grief. I think that was one of the motors behind it all. Because I was living in Mexico where uh, grief was very present because a lot of people are being killed and we have twenty five thousand that have disappeared. And a lot is being written about the violence of it. And when you have so many people dying, there's basically like no time for grief. Mm -hmm. Dead pe people just become numbers and mm -hmm. disappeared people become like this long list of names. And a lot of writers are stopping in the violence, but I felt like no one was, or no, no one, probably people were doing, but I really felt the need to like say, stop, grief needs space. And I wanted to write a book that had nothing to do with the violence, but that allowed the time and space just to remember that every every time one person dies, a lot of lives are affected. Yeah. So that's why I wanted to like have these reflection games of mm. how many, even if it's not your sister, but you, someone you used to see every day, you're yeah. affected by it. And, 